Those of you who follow my work know that I frequently return to the question of sovereignty and the right behavior of kings. I'm often asked what possible relevance these stories have in the 20th century. So I'm going to try and answer that here. It would be a strange body of mythology that has just one message. And there are many possible messages in the myths of Celtic speaking cultures. Nor would I say that we should depend solely on mythology or religion or the law for our sense of right and wrong. Developing that sense requires soul searching experience and ideally a good upbringing. We don't really need Celtic myth or religion to tell us what's right or what's wrong, but I do believe what I'm going to share is vitally important. And for people like me who believe that our myths and folklore are also important and have much to teach us, I hope this will demonstrate that there are frequent messages warning against abuse of the natural world in Celtic myth. All this is deeply bound up with those sovereignty concepts I'm always talking about. But I'm not going to start with kings and goddesses. Let's talk about cows. I think versions of this first story are told in both Scotland and Ireland. In many places, people believed that fairy cattle lived in bodies of water. In Wales, they tended to live in lakes, but in Gaelic Scotland, it was often the sea. They were known as Cro Mara, sea cattle, or Cro She, fairy cattle. People said mating your cows to one of the fairy bulls could improve your stock. And there are some stories about how the cattle on the Isle of Skye, for example, descend from the Craw Mara. Well, there was a farmer living beside the water, and near his farm there was a small wild island. Every May, this one cow of his would swim over to the island, and when she came back, she'd be in calf. Well, the cows were marvelous and grew up to give a lot of milk. So the farmer happily let her go to the island every year. And everyone said there must be a tar of she, a fairy bull living on the island, but they never saw it. Over the years, the farmer built up his herd. Even the second and third generation of the cows from the wandering cow were better than all his others. After a few years, he had enough money to build a new house. Of course, this was in the days when people still had their cattle in one end of the house and only a partition to keep them out of the living quarters. But even so, it was a very nice house. Well, the years went by, and the farmer thought the wandering cow was getting a bit old, and if she were to drown crossing to the island, then he might not get any final benefit out of her. So one evening he said to his wife, I think we should slaughter that wandering cow and at least have the meat from her, in case she doesn't come back. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, there was a commotion in the byre end of the house, and the cow and all her offspring, to the last generation, put their horns to the walls of the house and stampeded through it like it was made of paper. They disappeared and never were seen again, and the farmer's house was destroyed. Now, you can make of that story what you will, but it does seem like the farmer made an error in judgment of some kind. Depending on your point of view, you might say killing an animal is wrong, or you might just think, don't get on the wrong side of the she. There are similar stories from Wales, like the famous tale about a lake called Flynn Barvog. Now, there were fairy women who lived in this lake, and people would see them sometimes all dressed in green dresses, grazing their cattle on the slopes around the lake. Their cattle were of the very best quality, and people often thought about capturing one, but the fairy cattle kept to themselves, so this wasn't easy. However, there was one old farmer whose land was near the lake, and he noticed that sometimes the fairy cattle mixed in a bit with his herd, and as a result, he managed to coax one of the fairy cows away and tame her. Well, she was the best cow you could imagine, her milk was very plentiful, and her butter and cheese were so rich that people would seek it out at the market and pay a high price for it. Over the years, she gave him a number of excellent calves. Soon his whole herd was improved, and he grew quite wealthy. After a few years, the farmer thought that the fairy cow might be getting old, and surely she would die soon, or her milk would fail. So he did what any farmer might, and fattened her up to slaughter her. She put on weight beautifully, and all the neighbors waited to see how much meat he would get, hoping for a bit of a feast. The butcher was called, he raised up his great knife to deliver the killing chop, but halfway through the stroke, an unearthly cry came from the lake. 
A green-clad woman appeared over the lake and began calling the cow to her. She went running back to the lake, followed by all the members of the farmer's herd, which were descended from her. The people watched in horror as all the cattle made a circle around the fairy woman and began to descend into the lake, never to be seen again. The farmer spent his old age in poverty and misery. What have we learned from these stories? They're very similar. Both times everything is going well. The farmer gets fairy cattle, which are increasing his wealth steadily, until he crosses the line, decides the cow is too old, and makes plans to slaughter her. Our modern sensibilities, however, are not the same as country people a few hundred years back when these kinds of stories were being told. They would have been used to farmers culling older cows. It was considered the thrifty thing to do. Perhaps they would still have thought that the cow who brought all the wealth should be treated differently. Or maybe they would just have thought mm, getting entangled with the good folk never ends that well. It's in Irish folklore that we find another marvelous cow known by various names, but I'll just call her the Glass Gaunach, the gray cow of the smith. Now it's likely that the smith in these tales is really the god Govnu, or that the smith character, who has names like Gavagin Gau or Aelin Gau, kind of descends from the god Govnu, although some of the storytellers in later centuries might not have known that. Like the fairy cattle we've met, the glass gownick gives copious amounts of milk, but she's not without her problems. And one way or another, these stem from the need to control her, or alternatively, they stem from taboos against controlling her. I'm not going to tell any of her stories in their entirety, but I do want to look at some passages from stories about her so that we can understand her better. Now, these two stories were both collected by Jeremiah Curtin, a folklorist from the U.S. who was working in Ireland in the 1800s. Curtin tried to write the Irish names phonetically, based on how different storytellers pronounced them, which makes them look strange if you know Irish. This was once a common practice, although most people don't do it anymore, so that's why the names look a bit odd. This first story tells how a smith called Aelin Gau goes on an adventure to win the Glas Gaunach, who's in the possession of a king. The storyteller explains what is required of anyone who tries to look after the cow. In minding the cow, the man had to follow her always, never go before her or stop her or hold her. If he did, she would run home to the castle. The man must stop with her when she wanted to get a bite or a drink. She never traveled less than 60 miles a day, eating a good bite here and a good bite there and going hither and over. In this story, great emphasis is put on the importance of never forcing or controlling the cow. She must be given her head, allowed to make her own decisions at all times, and exactly how the cow's minder brings her home safe at night is never fully explained. In another story, the smith is now in possession of the cow, and the conditions under which she lives with him are described. At that time, there was a smith in Erin called Gaivnin Gau, and he had a cow called the Glass Gaunach. The smith had a magic halter with which he used to tie the cow every night. Glasgownock traveled three provinces of Erin every day and came home in the evening. The halter had power over her, and she went always to the halter in the evening if left to herself. The cow gave milk to everyone on her journey each day. No matter how large the vessels were that the people brought, or how many, she filled them. There was no lack of milk in Erin while that cow was in it. She was sent to give food and comfort to all, and she gave it, but especially to poor people. So this cow is a source of enormous abundance. She isn't just making one farmer rich, like the fairy cattle we heard about earlier. She's feeding the poor of Ireland. And you'll notice here the importance of the halter, which isn't used to lead or control the cow, except that she returns to it at night. As long as the smith has the halter, he and the cow get along fine, with very little effort on his part. Unfortunately, trouble's on the horizon because the evil giant Balor manages to steal the halter, hoping the cow will also be his come nightfall. But the smith isn't going to let that happen if he can help it. Gaivin and Gau ran quickly to the glass gownock, caught her by the tail and held her that way till evening when he drove her home carefully and shut her up in the forge behind the bellows where he milked her. Gaivin and Gau stopped work on his forge now and did nothing but mind the cow. 
He went out in the morning, followed her through every place, and brought her back in the evening. He held her tail all the day, and never let go his hold of her till he had her fastened behind the bellows. Of course, this creates a problem for the smith, because he now spends his days babysitting the cow, knowing that she would run away to Balor, who has the halter. Because of that, he can't make swords and spears for the heroes of Ireland, which kind of upsets everything. And it's by trying to get a bit of work done that he eventually loses the cow. I tell the full story in another video called Lou Flay if you want to hear it. But right now, let's look at some different stories. This next kind of story is usually called a fairy bride story. Welsh folklore is especially rich in these. I'll tell you one now, and then we'll look at the structure of it together. Here we go. There was a young man, the son of a shepherd, and he was looking after the sheep one morning out on the hill. It was a bit misty, and as he came to a peat stack, he realized that there was a very pretty girl sheltered against the stack, and she was crying. He went to her and tried to comfort her and find out what the trouble was. The two were immediately smitten with one another, but before she could tell him why she was crying, her father appeared. He led the girl away without saying much to the shepherd. Over the next few days, the young man spent every minute he could lingering by the peat stack, hoping to see the girl again. The girl wanted to see him too, but it was days before she managed to slip away from her father. When she finally did, he guessed where she was. By the time the girl's father caught up with her, she and the young man were sitting together talking of love. The father could see that the young man was a good sort and that the boy and girl truly loved each other and after a great deal of persuasion, he agreed to their marriage. The father revealed to the shepherd that he and his daughter were of the fairy race, the Tolwith Teg. He made it clear that there were dangers for the girl in marrying a mortal, and warned the young man that if he ever struck the girl with iron, the marriage would be at an end. With that, he gave the shepherd's son a bag of gold as a dowry. It was a good match. The couple got on well together, had children. One day they were trying to catch some ponies to take to a fair, but the ponies were a bit wild and they weren't having much luck. Finally, the man got very close to one pony, but just as he was about to grab it by the mane and slip the bridle on, all the ponies galloped off again. The shepherd had had enough and in a rage he flung the bridle at the departing ponies. But somehow, quite by accident, the bridle hit his wife, and the bit, which was made of iron, struck her. Within a few seconds, her father appeared with a whole host of her people and took the woman away. She seemed to go with them quite willingly, without even saying goodbye, although the dowry of gold was left behind. The shepherd was heartbroken, and the children were left motherless. Perhaps the most famous story in this category is the tale of the Lady of Flynne van Vach, and how her sons became the famous physicians of Mudvai, this is a long and involved tale, but it's worth looking at one or two ideas within it. The story tells how a young man meets a beautiful fairy woman who emerges from a lake. With the help and advice of his mother, he manages to overcome the various obstacles her father puts in the way of their love and marries her. However, as often happens in these stories, the father lays a taboo on the young man that should he strike his new wife three times in anger, the marriage would be at an immediate end. There are two versions of this tale, and the breaking of the taboo is treated differently in the two. The simpler version of the story says that one day the couple were preparing to go to a fair. The husband asked his wife to go and catch the horse so that he could hitch it up, but she was a bit slow. He tapped her three times, almost playfully with his gloves, saying, go, 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 and that was all it took. Not only did she leave, she took the livestock she had brought to the marriage away with her, seven cows, two oxen, and a bull. She still continued to meet her son from time to time in a nearby coom, so the story goes. In the more elaborate version of the tale, this counts as the first blow, and two further incidents occur, equally minor, before the lady takes her livestock and returns to the lake. Perhaps you can already see how the stories of fairy cows, which we looked at first, and the stories of these fairy brides have something in common. In both instances, the farmer gets something from the other world, which allows him to take more from the land than he would otherwise be able to do. Either the fairy cow brings wealth and abundance, or the fairy bride has the power to take abundance away, which of course the cow does too. 
The fairy cow doesn't warn the farmer that if he decides to slaughter her, she'll run away, taking all her calves with her. But perhaps there's an implication that he should have known better, that he should have realized that the cow is a kind of sacred gift and that he should proceed more respectfully. In the case of the glass gownock, the taboos are better understood, but difficult to adhere to. And there's the additional complication of the special halter, the means of controlling the magical cow. In many of the Welsh tales of fairy brides, although the taboo seems to concern mistreating the wife, the mistreatment comes at a moment when a horse is about to be bridled, like the couple trying to catch the ponies or the man wanting to hitch the horse to the carriage. This occurs too often in these stories to just be coincidence, and it echoes concerns over the glass gownach and her halter, especially the idea that one shouldn't try to control her, but rather just follow her and protect her. Unlike the cow, the fairy brides and their fathers are able to tell the farmer how he must behave. It seems clear enough, but the farmer is a little careless, and that's all it takes. As I said, there are many such stories, especially in Wales. Each one has specific details which makes it unique, but they also have a common structure. Coming up next, we'll take a look at that structure and think about what it might mean. If you'd like to delve a little deeper into the topics in my videos, you might enjoy taking one of my online classes. You can find out more about them at the link which is on your screen now. You can also support my work on Ko-fi or by becoming a patron. You'll also find free content to read on my Patreon page and on my website. All the links are in the description. This basic outline is common to many stories about fairy brides. A man, usually a farmer, courts a fairy woman who often emerges from a lake. Her father places a condition on the man not to strike her in anger or not to strike her with iron. The bride brings a dowry. Often this dowry is livestock to the marriage. The husband breaks his bargain, but it's kind of an accident. The wife departs, often taking her livestock with her. The turning point in these stories is the farmer being careless and breaking the taboo. In the fairy bride stories, the taboo is usually related to touch, to striking the woman in some way, however innocently. The harm done to the woman is symbolic rather than actual, and I think that it's really the husband's carelessness which is the issue here. The taboo placed by the father is really saying something like, you have entered into a very sacred contract here. This woman will allow you to take more from the land than you could without her agreement. You have to keep this constantly in mind and behave impeccably at all times. Something similar, but on a grander scale, was expected of kings in early Celtic societies. The farmer may not be as rich and impressive as a king, but the basic contract to oversee the land and extract wealth from it is similar, and his responsibility to be extremely attentive and respectful is also similar. According to Ammianus Marcellinus, a Roman historian writing in the 4th century, Celtic tribes held their kings accountable for misfortunes which affected them. This is borne out in stories from Ireland, such as The Adventures of Art, Son of Con. The aging King Con takes a wife who was intended for his son, bringing about a terrible famine. According to law tracts, among the things which might attest the falsehood of a king were dearth in his reign, dryness of cows, blight of fruit, or scarcity of grain. On the flip side, the praise poetry of the bards of Wales and Ireland constantly paint a picture of the perfect behavior expected of kings. They must not only defend their people, but assure wealth for them through good husbandry and distribute that wealth with great generosity. And that was only the tip of the iceberg. They must give fair judgments, be in good health, and entirely honorable in every way. All of this falls under the heading of sovereignty. That sovereignty, according to myth, must be bestowed on a king by a goddess or some other mysterious female figure. The king has intercourse with her, in some cases he marries her, or occasionally she's seen to symbolically offer him a cup. Sovereignty is not, as we might expect today, all about the respect due to the sovereign king, 
or respect for the borders of a sovereign nation or its right to self-determination. Sovereignty, once bestowed by the favor of the female sovereignty figure, becomes a duty and a responsibility to be carried out with the utmost care and dedication. While it bestows certain privileges, it's also beset with a thousand pitfalls so that the king or farmer needs to be constantly vigilant regarding their own behavior. I think you can easily see now how the farmer and the fairy wife and the king and the goddess are really pointing to the same thing, a contract between the people who depend on the land for sustenance and the sacred land itself embodied in a goddess or fairy woman. You may have heard some other stories where it's the man's carelessness with his word rather than with the woman's physical body which gets him into trouble. In The Debility of the Ulsterman, the story of Macha running in a horse race, it is the goddess Macha herself who warns her husband not to mention her when he goes to the fair. Of course, he gets a bit tipsy and blurts out something which offends the king. My wife could run faster than the king's horses, he shouts. This moment of carelessness brings about a cascade of misfortune on Macha, on her husband and the entire kingdom. The king demands that the heavily pregnant Macha run a race against his horses. The warriors of Ulster do not come to her defense, and this humiliation makes her angry so that she curses the men of Ulster. In the story of Friannon in the Mabinogi, she comes from the other world, having chosen a husband. This is Puich, the ruler of a kingdom called David. At their wedding feast, Friannon's rejected suitor approaches Puich with a seemingly innocent request. Puich carelessly replies that he will grant him whatever he asks. The man demands Rhiannon. This seems particularly unfair because Puich received no forewarning. He didn't realize who the man was. He isn't breaking a taboo or condition as such, but nevertheless, he has been careless. He is a king and his honor is paramount. The basic fairy bride structure is less obvious here because of the many extra plot devices and details. However, much boils down to Puch being careless with the thing most precious to him as a ruler, the female sovereignty figure. It should also be obvious to him that his bride is someone very special. She is clearly otherworldly and due an extra layer of care and respect. He should have known better than to make an open-ended promise to a stranger. Priyanon manages to patch the situation up with a magic bag and some trickery, only for Puish to be a little careless a second time when he allows the rejected suitor to be unfairly abused. Although at first it seems that the couple have got away with it, there are dire consequences for that abuse, which only become apparent much later in Priyanon's story. It's also worth noticing how both Priyanon and Macha are treated in their stories. Macha is forced to run a race as if she's a horse. In Rhiannon's story, there are two episodes in which she's treated as if she's a horse. First, she's expected to offer to carry strangers on her back. Later, she's made to wear a donkey's work collar. These episodes are humiliating to the goddesses in the stories. They show the men who supposedly hold the sovereignty over the territory exerting too much control to the point of humiliation over the female sovereignty figure. Now that you know a bit more about the relationship between the female sovereignty figure and the male steward of the land, whether that's a farmer or a king, you'll be better equipped to understand what's going on in these stories. You can probably see that stories of the fairy cow are about greed, a bit like the husband in the fairy bride stories. The farmer has entered into a kind of sacred partnership. Because the fairy cow allows it, he's able to extract a greater bounty from the land than he would normally be able to do. He should be bearing in mind the sacred or magical nature of the cow, but he has started to take the situation for granted. He has come to see the cow as simply a possession, and he has the right to do as he likes with his possessions, or so he thinks. His carelessness ends in disaster, just as the carelessness of the farmer and kings toward their wives does in the other stories. There's one more episode from Irish myth that I'd like to look at. 
The long tale known as the Second Battle of Maitwera tells how the Tua Daidanen, essentially a race of gods, find themselves at war with the Fomorians, who are known for their greed. The Tua Dei are the victors, and they have the defeated former king, Bres Macalaha, as a prisoner. He asks them if there is something he can do so that they will spare his life. He first offers to make their cows give milk all year, which isn't the natural way of things. But the Tua Dedanen are suspicious of this, and they refuse his offer. Then he tells them that he can make their fields produce a crop of wheat four times in a year, once in every season, and this is their answer. This has suited us, spring for plowing and sowing, and the beginning of summer for maturing the strength of the grain, and the beginning of autumn for the full ripeness of the grain, and for reaping it, winter for consuming it. In other words, they twice reject an offer of what is essentially intensive farming, an interesting lesson from long before we generally think anyone cared about such things. These stories preserve some important cultural ideas, but the message tends to get buried or lost among the clutter of longer and more complex stories. There's a huge warning here for mankind. We have long since stopped heeding this warning. We have taken and taken from the earth, not only agriculturally, but in a thousand other ways. And now the disasters of the Anthropocene are upon us. Our benefactor, the earth, has given far too much, received too many blows and humiliations. We have not been good stewards, and we have squandered our sovereignty. One difference between our situation and those portrayed in the stories is the problem of sovereignty itself. Ancient Celtic kings bore the ultimate responsibility for the health of their kingdoms. It was up to individual landowners to treat the land and their livestock well. We're all in a sacred pact with nature, whether we like it or not, but increasing population, urbanization, and even the rise of democracy means that we are less and less able to identify the individual culprits who break that pact and we are less able to topple them. Theoretically, in a democracy, we each hold our own tiny piece of sovereignty. But the reality of modern life is such that we're often unable to identify the people who are the worst offenders in the breaking of our sacred pact with nature. Business interests, with no regard for the consequences of what they do, hide behind the governments they largely control. There are no easy answers to this problem, yet I believe that at least some answers may lie in these stories if we are willing to look at them fearlessly.